Despite being widely hailed as one of, if not the single best entry within the franchise, Final Fantasy VI fails to receive the notoriety and respect it deserves. With an unmatchable charm and vibrancy, lifetimes of replayability, and a story and cast that deeply resonates with people almost 30 years later. Let's examine what makes this game so beloved and timeless. This is the ultimate Final Fantasy VI iceberg. Lightning in a Bottle FF6, known as FF3 in America, set the bar impossibly high for RPG game development. With all the countless hours of content in this game, and often hailed as the single best Final Fantasy game in the franchise, it's amazing that it only took about 30 people to make in total. It took roughly 5 planners, 5 programmers, 10 graphic artists, 2 music technicians, and a handful of assistants only about a year and a half to create. During this time in game development, there were heavy crunch times set in place before the developers. They would work such long hours that they would often sleep at the office, practically living out of it at times. The unbridled tenacity of the team even inspired the great Nobuo Uematsu, who was at the time considering quitting the video game industry altogether after Final Fantasy V. And many considered FF6 to feature Uematsu's magnum opus, Dancing Mad. The entire team was completely committed to creating the best game experience possible, and it shows in the final product. We'll truly never see such a monumental project be developed in such a short time span ever again. River Poison The act that made Kefka the diabolical villain which he became known for. Kefka poisoned a castle's water supply via a nearby river, killing off the entire population of Doma Castle, including Kayan's wife and child. Largest Playable Cast Outside of 14, and perhaps Tactics, FF6 has the largest playable cast of any game in the mainline series. So much so, that it would become the first game in the series to allow the player to swap characters in and out as they see fit, and allowing the player to dictate the leader of the party. The game features an impressive cast of 10 permanent characters, as well as multiple optional characters to unlock by performing specific sets of action. On top of this, there are a number of temporary characters that can join your party throughout your game to assist you in battles. And perhaps what's even more noteworthy is that nearly all of the characters have a fleshed out backstory with the tasks for designing them being split between multiple staff members instead of one or two people like in many games before and after. And to this day, it's still debated who actually serves as the main protagonist of this game. Bannon and Arvis's Fate Everyone's favorite healer, Bannon and Arvis, one of the first NPCs you speak to in the game as an old man in the Returners, both are left with ambiguous fates. While it's never been officially stated, it's heavily implied that Bannon and Arvis were both destroyed by Kefka, specifically during the creation of his tower. When asked about the fate of these characters in an interview, Hironobu Sakaguchi replied with the vague answer of quote, Use your imagination. Controversial Celeste this character has several controversial scenes that barely even made it into the American version of the game. When we're introduced to the character, she is bound in a cell beside Locke along with several guards. In the Japanese version of the game, it's heavily implied that these guards are actually doing horrible and unspeakable things to the bound up character. Not only that, but Locke was forced to sit quietly and listen to the atrocious acts being committed only able to wait patiently until he received an opportunity to help her. Locke feels tremendous guilt for being unable to help her sooner, and Celeste subtly blames him throughout the rest of the Japanese version. This was taken out of the American version, even removing the shackles that bound the woman to be helpless against the guards. 
On top of this controversial scene, she also leaps off of a cliff to her death if she's unable to save Sid in the game, only to wash up ashore later. This scene, however, obviously made the cut into the American version. Sid's Fate This incredibly important reoccurring character, Sid, has a fate that is left up to the player. Yashinori Katasi, the programmer of the character, has stated that his original intent for Sid was to die in any scenario, but eventually he would change his mind and allow the player the ability to save him after he falls ill. By catching and feeding him only the fastest fish, Celeste can actually save Sid, but there are no hints throughout the game to suggest that this is the case. So most people will unfortunately see the brilliant scientist perish. Sabin Train Suplex During the Phantom Train boss fight with Sabin and Kyan, Sabin is able to perform his move Suplex. This is odd as most large enemies throughout the game are immune to this attack, but the enormous train is somehow susceptible to it. The ridiculous concept would go on to meme status through the years, becoming a fan favorite for many players, especially at speedrun events like Awesome Games Done Quick. Unique Tent Animations Each of the characters have their own unique animation that is played when using a tent item. Each of them are thematic with their character's color scheme and personality. Dinosaur Forest There is a forest north of the Velt in the World of Ruin where you can encounter two dinosaurs, the Brachiosaurs and the Tyrannosaurs. These nasty, unique creatures can be devastating for underdeveloped parties. However, both of the dinosaurs give you a boatload of experience. If you have a growth egg, you can reach high levels in just a few hours. On top of that, they give 5 to 10 AP, which makes leveling spells fairly quick as well. But perhaps the most noteworthy aspect of the Brachiosaur, one of the most powerful regular encounters in the game, is the economizer that can drop. This powerful item changes the costs of all spells and lores in the game to only 1 MP, making spellcasting practically free. This item can also be equipped with the gem box, which allows players to cast two spells in a single turn for only 1 MP each. Triangle Island While on the subject of challenging regular encounters, it's worth noting Triangle Island. Several monsters can be found on this island located in the northeast corner of the World of Balance. While these enemies offer quite a challenge, they don't offer much in terms of tangible rewards, except for the Zone Eater, a giant worm that can literally eat party members. If all four members are eaten, they will reappear in the Zone Eater's belly, and if you can survive the various traps in the area, it can allow you to recruit the optional character Gogo. Cactuars Continuing on with challenging areas, we should cover cactuars. These elusive creatures are found in the desert south of Miranda. They're unique in that they only have three hit points, but they're incredibly difficult to hit. If you equip a character with a sniper sight, it will help to make quick work of these creatures. You will receive AP and 10,000 GP for defeating these creatures. The Gigantor Esper can also be found here as well, and if you're unprepared, your party can wipe very quickly. Czar Dragon Perhaps the most famous FF6 rumor of all time was the unlockable hidden boss battle against the Czar Dragon. It was rumored to be unlocked by petrifying the blue dragon, which is not possible, allowing the player to collect the Raiden Magicite without having to exchange for Odin. After defeating the eight dragons while possessing all the Magicite in the game, it would force the player to fight an even more challenging version of the eight dragons, culminating with the Tsar Dragon. This disproven rumor would go on to claim that the reward for defeating the Tsar Dragon would be an item that revived General Leo. 
This rumor came about after hackers would discover the unfinished dragon in the game's files, complete with dialogue sections. The unfinished enemy would be added into future versions of the game, though not in the manner that the rumor had suggested. The Royal Discount It doesn't explicitly advertise this, but if the player keeps Edgar as the leader of the party, merchants will give their king a 50% discount on all of the items. Sadly, Sabin does not receive the same benefit. Baker? Yes, Rom? Remember to remind people to do the algorithm thing. Rom, they already know to like and subscribe and leave a comment. You are welcome. <sighs> Ungrateful son of a- Ragnarok Choice The Ragnarok is an esper that takes shape as a metallic claymore with dark gray and red grip. When the party delivers it to the weapons shop owner in Narche, he says he can melt the sword down and reforge it into a sword blade, or you can keep it as is. If you choose the sword, it can serve as a decent weapon, but it can eventually be bet at the Colosseum to obtain the strongest weapon in the game, the Lightbringer, otherwise known as Illumina. If you choose to keep the Magicite as an Esper, you can learn Ultima, the most powerful spell in the game. Locke's Lover After Locke's father died, he was forced to become a petty thief to survive, and most people generally treated him as such. However, one woman actually treated him well, and seemed to be understanding of his chosen path. Her name was Rachel. Her father refused to let her daughter see Locke. In an attempt to prove himself worthy, Locke took Rachel along a mission to find a great treasure. However, an incident occurred on their journey. Rachel sacrificed herself to save Locke from falling down a chasm, but Locke leapt down the chasm after her anyway. She lost her memory as a result of the fall. Her father blamed Locke, and upon seeing him, Rachel simply asked him to leave. Locke obliged this request and moved out of their town to allow her to start a new life without him. However, only just after he left the town, it was attacked by the Gestalian Empire. Shortly after this, Locke had returned to the town only to discover that Rachel's memory had returned just before her death. Her last words were his name. Naturally, Locke was plagued with guilt, and he brings her back to life for only a moment before merging with the Phoenix Esper used to revive her. Slot Rigging Many people find that Setzer's slot ability is a bit underwhelming, but in the SNES version of the game, players found that they were able to manipulate the results of the slot's ability by pausing during the slot's animation. You can even rig it so you pull the rarest roll of the game, 777, which instantly kills all enemies in battle. However, using this method also allows for easier acquisition of the least desirable roll in the game, 7-7 seven, seven bar, which instantly kills all allies, while also ignoring your own immunity to death. The world is square. During the party's visit to Daryl's tomb, there is a puzzle that requires several seemingly random sets of letters, but when read backwards, it reads out, the world is square. This is not only a reference to the company that developed the game, but also a subtle pun and reference to the world map of the game that is literally in the shape of a square. Sketch Glitch Perhaps the most infamous glitch in FF6, the sketch glitch has destroyed more save files than could count. Several horror stories were gruesomely recounted in the comments of my last FF6 video involving unknowingly using this glitch. The most common route to activate it is by casting Realm's Sketch ability on an invisible enemy, which is most often achieved by preemptively casting Vanish on the enemy. This will garble the save file in a similar manner to the infamous Missing No glitch from Pokemon. Using this glitch radically and permanently alters your save file, breaking your item inventory, potentially giving you some of the most powerful items in the game quickly and easily. You'll also see a number of graphical glitches occurring, 
as a result of this glitch as well. This glitch would become renowned in the community, and similar to the Sabin Train Suplex, it would go on to become a popular exhibition at speedrun events like Summer Games Done Quickly. Recruiting Leo There exist several glitches where the player can recruit Leo to the party. The first method essentially breaks the sequence of events through a very time-consuming and arduous process. While it's technically possible, there are several caveats about this glitched in character. His equipment cannot be changed, though he can be set as the party leader. And depending on your character recruitment afterwards, you may permanently lose access to other characters. Entering certain situations with Leo, like the Colosseum, will also hard freeze the game. It's also rumored to be possible to use Sketch Glitch to re-render a character into the Leo sprite. Evade Bug This is a bug within the early versions of the game that makes the evade stat insignificant in a rate in which your character would dodge a physical attack. Instead, Magic Evasion determines the rate of evading both magical and physical attacks. Items and statuses that affect your hit rating are impacted by this bug as well. Broken Abilities A number of abilities and status effects are broken in the original version of the game. Fixed Dice and Offering are both broken, stating that they only deal half damage. However, the way attack and defense are set up, half damage doesn't actually make it deal half damage. There also exists several bugs with Kyan's Bushido technique, Sky. One allows Kyan to counter any physical attack dealt if KO'd and revived while in Sky status. Another bug involves Kyan simply being affected by the imp status while in Sky status. He will end up counterattacking with a simple physical attack instead of his sky attack, which allows him to keep his sky status. The Psycho Kyan bug allows him to effectively attack and counterattack his own attack with another attack. This loop continues until all enemies are dead. Another infamously broken effect is that of the blind status. Due to the aforementioned evade bug, the blind status ailment is glitched and doesn't work whatsoever. The Ultimate Magicite Crusader, otherwise known as Jihad, is the game's ultimate magicite that deals impressive damage, even to your own party. It's said to be made up of three entities, Demon, Devil, and Goddess. And according to the 20th Anniversary Ultimania, the Crusader contains a fragment of the power of the Warring Triad, the gods of magic in the realm. Shadow is Realm's Father The game heavily implies that Shadow is indeed Realm's father, and the developers would go on to confirm this being factual in several interviews. We also learn that there were plans to initially include an additional cutscene around this. It would feature Strago confronting Shadow asking him to reveal his face and to confirm that he is indeed her father. The scene wouldn't have shown Shadow's face, as he would be facing away from the player, and Strago's reaction would have been left ambiguous, leaving the player to speculate either way. Kutan Glitch This is also known as the Bypass Event Glitch or the Moghan Glitch. It takes place during Locke's scenario in South Figaro. There is an NPC soldier that prevents Locke from leaving town. To perform this glitch, the player should wait until the soldier moves on a bottom tile down towards Locke. If you time your movement to open the menu window at the same time, you will appear on the same block as the soldier, allowing you to bypass some parts of the game, forcing Locke to go through Figaro Castle solo. This has some side effects as well, most notably replacing Celeste with the Moghan Moogle throughout the rest of your game. South Figaro Hidden Bridge Also during Locke's South Figaro scenario, you're expected to steal several soldiers' outfits to get to the next area. 
Players were able to discover what appears to be a completely forgotten travel path, eliminating the need to steal the outfits. Unused Bosses There were several named creatures that never made it into the final game. One was the Colossus, another was this alternate Umaru, and of course this includes the previously mentioned Zar Dragon. Better Chest Loot There exist several chests throughout the game that, if left alone during their initial access to an area, you can return at later points in the game. When accessing these chests at later points, you will actually receive better loot than if you were to acquire them during your first visit. Some of these chests can be found in the Cave of Figaro, in the town of South Figaro, and the Magitech Factory. This same technique was also used in Chrono Trigger, which if you haven't seen my video on the series, be sure to check it out after this. Unobtainable Rages there exist four slots in Gao's Rage Command list that are unable to be acquired. Siegfried is supposed to be a stronger version of the enemy fought in the Colosseum. Typhon, otherwise known as Chupan, is Ultra's friend from the Colosseum. Since Colosseum enemies are unable to be found on the Velt, it's impossible to acquire either of these two. The Death Warden, otherwise known as Alo Ver, is the skeleton guarding the tiger fangs in the Velt Cave. The ability is said to make Gao undead, weak to fire, and with the special move of Quake. It's unable to be acquired due to a programming mistake, but was fixed in the Game Boy Advance port. The Tonberries, otherwise known as Pugs, would use a powerful physical attack called Knife, but due to the way the command was set up, the final command on the list is unable to be used. Rescuing Shadow If you wait until the last 5 seconds before jumping to the airship from the floating continent, you can give Shadow enough time to catch up and join you for the final escape. This is entirely optional, however, and Shadow can be left behind, removing the ability to play him in that save file. Chocobo Visual Glitch In the original game, if you walk in a particular manner of the top section of the Chocobo sprite, your character will appear through the Chocobo. Vanish Doom Bug This bug was only featured in the early versions of the game, utilizing the vulnerability to magic attacks that enemies acquire when invisible, Players could cast Vanish on enemies, followed by the death spell, to instantly one-shot them. By doing this, you override the enemy's death immunity, allowing you to kill even bosses, although this would sometimes cause glitches within the game. Capture Glitch This happens when you use the Mug command with Lock. Certain items in the game have adverse consequences when using the command. For instance, Ultima Weapon will only deal normal damage, cannot ignore defense, and counts as a short sword. Another example would be the hit rating from dice not functioning as it normally should, making it near impossible to connect with an enemy. There are other issues with the capture glitch as well, like the Relic Master's Scroll or any attempt to steal multiple items within a single turn. After having Locke use Capture while wearing the Master Scroll, the first item will always be stolen, but any items that would be stolen after the first time will not be added to your inventory unless the monster is alone. This can be particularly devastating in certain fights like the Ultima weapon where you can completely miss out on your chance to steal a ribbon. Removed Siege Section the Siege of Narshe originally included an additional segment if Kefka and his soldiers were able to push back your troops. The removed section included sprites of the Esper being pursued, a Mughal, Kefka and his soldiers. However, the scene was never completed and was removed from the final game, instead making it a game over when Kefka's soldiers reach Bannon. Odin and Raiden in the ancient castle, 
You witness Odin becoming a magicite that you are able to acquire. Upon examination, you will find out that you will receive plus one speed after each level up, which is great because it's the only esper that gives a speed bonus upon leveling up. However, if you choose, you can proceed down the stairs to the right after acquiring the esper to speak to the stone queen and level up your Odin into Raiden. Cursed Shield After getting Locke in the World of Ruin, you can take him to Narshe, where you can speak to the man hiding in his house. He gives you the Cursed Shield that, when equipped, you will be struck with a variety of different status ailments every fight. Many players have just taken it off and not thought much of it, but if you complete 256 battles with the shield equipped, it transforms into the most powerful shield in the game, the Paladin Shield. The Paladin Shield is also great because it's one of the few methods of learning the Ultima spell. Shield Glitch The difficulty of leveling up the aforementioned Curse Shield was made significantly easier with this glitch. If you equip the shield in battle instead of before the battle, the character will not gain the negative status ailments of the cursed shield, but will instead gain immunity to the negative status effects, making you completely immune to doom, silence, berserk, confusion, and sap. This also had the same effect with the force shield by making you immune to shell instead of automatically giving it to your character. Bannon Riding Sprite Bannon's sprite was never programmed to be on a chocobo. If you manage to control him and ride one, it will display these weird graphics. One sprite even looks like a golden terra morph. Desperation Attacks These are also called near-death special skills or Hidden Blitz, as the achievement suggests in the mobile and Steam versions of the game. They are character-specific, unique attacks, serving as the precursor to the Limit Break mechanic that would become popular in FF7 and beyond. Characters below 1 8th of their maximum HP after the first 20 seconds of the battle can enter critical status. The character then has a 1 in 16 chance of performing their character-specific desperation attack. All except Umaru and Gao, who do not have this ability. Desperation attacks are unblockable and ignore defense, and it's unable to occur if characters have Confuse, Image, Vanish, or Zombie statuses. Rippler Bug This is a bug that would eventually be fixed in the 2014 version. The Lore Rippler's effect is exchanging the statuses between the caster and the target of the spell. Its original intention is to limit the statuses exchanged to standard effects like Zombie, Sleep, Reflect, Haste, etc., but it actually exchanged all statuses, including effects that aren't necessarily castable or even named. This includes Magitech, Petrify, KO, Dance, Rage, Frozen, Trance, Chanting, and Hidden. It even affects critical status, which allows you to perform desperation attacks without meeting the HP qualifications. It can also do some major harm in that the Interceptor Guard status from Shadow's pet can be transferred to an enemy, permanently losing access to the pet. On top of that, there is another bug with the Rippler and that it always hits even when it claims to miss. PS1 Port Cinematics When Final Fantasy was released for the PS1 in 99, it included ports for Final Fantasy V and VI. Along with the game came several additions, including several CGI cutscenes and a bonus menu that included a cinematics theater, concept art, bestiary, and more. Star Wars References There exist a number of Star Wars references within FF6. The first you encounter is Biggs and Wedge, who are two characters from Episode 4. 
Another direct reference is when Kefka throws the Emperor off the floating continent, which is reminiscent of Vader tossing the Emperor in Episode 6. There's also a reference to the Millennium Falcon from Setzer talking about the airship, and Celeste using a Princess Leia line in a similar situation. Denying Bannon Bannon will ask Tara if she wishes to join the Returners. If she rejects his offer three times, you will receive the Genji Glove. This is a very early opportunity to receive a very beneficial item. Umaru in World of Balance Umaru is able to be unlocked after accessing the World of Ruin, as part of a cliff collapses to reveal an opening in the Yeti's cave. But the Yeti can actually be seen briefly peeking out a hole in Narshe, looking out over the town. When people approach the hole, he will retreat away and hide. Cut Kefka Fights when you fight against Kefka in this scenario, it's programmed in a way that makes Kefka a playable character on your party, but has the players fight against them in this way. There are multiple encounters that use this method of fighting against enemies, but there are three sets of data set up this way for Kefka that are not used in the final game. This suggests that there may have been additional fights that were scrapped along the way. Shadows Past Through a series of dreams experienced throughout the game, we learn that Shadow was originally known as Clyde. Clyde and his partner Baram worked as a pair of train robbers over 10 years ago. They got exceedingly good at their craft and eventually took on the name the Shadow Bandits. On one job, Baram was injured while in hot pursuit by the authorities. Baram begged Shadow to end his life so he isn't caught, but Shadow could not do it and instead fled the scene, leaving Baram behind. Shadow forged a life in Thamasa where he married a woman and fathered a child who we would come to find out is Realm. However, before long, he feared the authorities would discover who he was and he eventually fled from town and his family. He took the family dog with him and the two become the mercenary pair known as Shadow and Interceptor that we encounter through the game. River Leveling Trick By setting your cursor to memory in the settings during the river rafting section with Bannon, you can choose the path that goes up after the save point. From here, have Edgar use his crossbow and Bannon heal. There are no mana or resource costs for a full party heal and a full enemy attack. Players would often set up various methods of automating the loop on the river for easy free leveling. Moogle Update Although the Moogle race had been featured in games prior to FF6, this was the first game that allowed the player to play as one. Not only that, but we also receive a design update for the race, becoming taller and leaner with a new eye design, as well as the addition of the pom-pom. This iconic little decoration would become a staple in many future iterations of the Moogle and has since become a staple within the FF franchise. Drowning Characters this takes place near the solitary island house in the World of Ruin on the beach. If you set Umaru or Kayan as the party leaders, their sprites will appear underwater as opposed to the other characters who are above water. This only happens with these two characters. Censorship and Ted Woolsey Not surprisingly, there were several censorships that occurred during the import to the SNES from Japan. Several notable changes include the spell Holy being renamed Pearl, the Summon Jihad renamed to Crusader, Hell's Rider was changed to Rider, and many of the more revealing sprites were censored, covering up skin and suggestive clothing. Ted Woolsey, the one responsible for localizing a number of great early RPGs, was tasked with the translating of this game and bringing it to the West. 
Of course, his work needed to fit within the censorship boundaries set forth by the West. FF6's script would be modified over the years throughout the re-releases, and many argue to an even drier tone than before. But a team of fans have meticulously gone through the original script and coding for the original censor script by Woolsey and brought forth a more accurate depiction of what would have been scripted without the censorship requirements. They have released their own ROM version of the game with this Ted Woolsey script, and it has received mostly positive praise. Changing Themes and Backgrounds while playing the SNES version, you can land the airship on a particular tile in the northern section of the Velt that will cause Terra's theme to play instead of the Velt music. It also causes the battle background to change as well. Minimum Character Playthrough Players would eventually discover that they can beat the entire game without ever unlocking a greater majority of the characters. The technical minimum would be three characters, Edgar, Celeste, and Setzer. Drill Hat The original Super Famicom allowed players to do a specific action input that allowed players to equip any item into any slot regardless of its type. Players were able to deduce that the single strongest item for the helmet slot is actually Edgar's drill tool. This meaning of equipping items was removed in future versions of the game, although it's been said that a lesser version of this bug still exists within the PlayStation version. Littering Easter Egg In the Returner hideout, you can find a scrap piece of paper. You can choose not to dispose of the paper, to which Bannon will complain about littering before the start of the meeting. Unobtainable Items Fans have found throughout the game there are several inaccessible items. They come as a result of having a chest or item one tile too far away to access by hand. Locks Legendary Treasure The Japanese script had much more dialogue during Locke's quest to save Rachel. It contained a lot of dialogue about a quote, legendary treasure that possessed the ability to revive people. They removed this terminology in the English script, making the acquisition of the phoenix seemingly much less important. Wind God Gao With a specific equipment combination for Gao, he can achieve unrivaled amounts of power. Using the relic Merit Award allows Gao to use equipment he cannot normally equip. This allows you to equip the Tempest, a katana for Kayan that randomly casts Wind Slash when attacking. Gao also equips the Master Scroll Relic, otherwise known as Offering, which causes the user's attack command to attack four times in a row against random enemies. And finally, when Gao uses the Cat Scratch enemy ability, it acts as a stronger version of the normal attack. This attack deals significant damage over 4 attacks, with each of the attacks having a 50% chance of casting Wind Slash. Empty Party Glitch There is a method of ending your playthrough with zero characters available. After Terra flies off, you can form a team of only Gao, and then you would hire Shadow to your team. Take them to the Velt, where Gao will leap an enemy. From here, take the Serpent Trench to Nakia and the Ferry to South Figaro. Then return to Narche and Shadow will abruptly leave the party. With both Shadow and Gao unavailable, the game cannot proceed, ending your playthrough altogether. Setzer's Bandana When Setzer initially joins the party on the SNES, he is originally wearing the bandana upon his arrival. However, because it is said that he dislikes Locke, he refuses to wear the same headgear. If you take off his bandana, you're unable to equip it ever again due to this reason. Airship Glitch 
If you have an early save file in the World of Balance, you can play the game up until you reach the floating continent. From there, you can leave the continent, then immediately re-enter. If you then die in the floating continent, you will return to your last save point before you reach the floating continent. But when you return to your save file, the game glitches out and you will receive access to the airship despite not having it yet. This allows you to sequence break entire sections of the game, and it allows you to do such things as permanently replace characters with temporary characters like Ghosts, General Leo, or Bannon, but players have found a number of different game-breaking options that are available by having early access to the airship. Door Menu Glitch On the SNES, certain doors throughout the game have strange interactions when you stand in their doorway and open the menu screen. Some of them even allow you to temporarily walk through objects around the door. Magitek Armor Bug during the sequence in the World of Ruin, in Kyan's Dream World, there is a segment where you begin wearing Magitek armor. If you manually change the leader of the party before exiting the area, that party member will retain the visuals of wearing the Magitek armor. If done right, you can place the visual bug on each of the 14 characters. Siegfried Imposter Cut Quest there are moments where Siegfried warns the party of an imposter. Most people believe that the Siegfried fought on the Phantom Train is the imposter, and the Siegfried at the Colosseum is the true character. In the early versions of the game, there was planned to be a segment where Gogo would impersonate the player's party members during their recruitment quest, and this was removed before the release of the final game. Setzer Airship Repair Scene There is an optional scene where Sid and Setzer are seen repairing the airship. This is a bit of dialogue that seems to foreshadow Daryl's existence within the World of Ruin. They also added unique dialogue in the Game Boy Advance version of the game that reveals the real reason the Blackjack lost the airship race. It was said that the ship was adorned with many casino equipments which would hinder its speed in a race. Edgar Blushes During a scene on the blackjack, Setzer compliments Celeste, causing her to blush in the process. But in the early versions of the game, Edgar would also blush. Many presume that this was due to Edgar feeling embarrassed or some other type of way, but because Edgar, Sabin, and Celeste all share the same sprite skin tone, when one blushes, they all blush. Except when Sabin is in the party instead of Edgar, neither Celeste nor Sabin blush. This was simply a programming complication rather than any implication of emotions for Edgar or Sabin. A World Reborn and Project Ultima Weapon there are popular mods for the game that allow you to replace the mobile UI, sprites, battle backgrounds, fonts, soundtrack, and much more. It allows you to see and play the game how you want to play it. Sabin the Wrestler There is a professional wrestler that goes by the name of Chris Sabin. It turns out he was an avid gamer growing up, and his stage name was a direct reference to the FF6 character. He even has a signature move called the Bum Rush. Kefka's Laugh Several other games and media projects would reuse Kefka's iconic laughing sound. Some projects include FF7, Chrono Trigger, several Kingdom Hearts games, and it even served as the laugh from the Sonic.exe creepypasta. Duncan Bug If you visit Duncan without Sabin and before learning Bum Rush, you can take advantage of a unique glitch. While Duncan is jumping around, you can open your menu window to reset the sprite's workout routine. If timed correctly, it can even cause the sprite to jump completely out of his house. Nintendo 64 Tech Demo 
Final Fantasy VII was originally planned to be released on the Nintendo 64. Before it was shifted over to the PlayStation, Square produced a short demonstration product on the SGI Onyx workstations, which was planned to be used for the N64. The demo used characters and settings from FF6, and it served as Square's first foray into real-time 3D graphics. Many even assumed that this was the precursor to an upcoming Final Fantasy title for the N64 console. But in any case, much of the same technology was used in the development of FF7 through 9. The demo was titled the Final Fantasy VI Interactive CG Game. In the video, we see a scantily clad Terra, Shadow, and a whip-wielding Locke defeat a golem of some kind. Biggs and Wedge didn't die. In the beginning of the game, the two NPCs escorting Terra disappear after being hit with a beam of light. There are no other mentions of them in the game, and most people assume that they perished at this point. But it was revealed in a 1996 interview that the beam actually just transported them to another dimension. This location would actually end up in the game Chrono Trigger. We aren't given much information about this incident other than Norstein would hire them to work within his Tent of Horrors. General Leo's Map When you first meet General Leo, he's standing by a tent that can't be seen inside by normal means. However, when you remove the roof element, you can see a map on a table that's not found anywhere else in the area. Angela. This was a scrapped character that was intended to serve as a potential love interest for Kyan. Her character was very assertive and flirty, which made Kyan feel very uncomfortable, only encouraging her to act in the manner. When Kyan's character continued its development, his wife and child being added made the love interest of Angela a poor option that would go on to be removed before long into development. Original Plans for Characters Locke and Terra were originally envisioned to be a pair of male thieves. Locke's appearance was said to have been much darker, and Terra would have been just a 20-year-old male instead of the 18-year-old female. She still would have retained her half-esper status either way. This concept was shelved and brought back into use for Zidane from FF9 and Titus from FF10. And even more interesting about Terra was her original plans for the game's finale. Upon her confrontation with Kefka in the final battle, she would have been destroyed by Kefka's rage. But the developers scrapped the idea because they didn't want the game to end on that much of a downer. Setzer and Shadow both used scrapped character designs from FF5. Celeste was originally going to be a spy who questions her end goal after she meets the party and becomes more attached to them. This angle would actually go on to be utilized in FF7 through Cut Shi's character. Umaru was originally meant to be found as a random battle on the overworld of the World of Balance. Players even found game files showing a battle script for Umaru in this manner. But since Gao would eventually take the role of a party member that's recruited through a random encounter, they scrapped the idea. And while Sabin and Edgar didn't change much throughout the development, we would learn in an interview that Sabin was actually petrified of squirrels after being bitten by one as a child. We would also see the character designer of the two Figaro brothers use them as inspiration for two characters from Xenogears, who also use the Figaro brothers' middle names, Roni and Rene. The two brothers were also planned to have a much darker scenario. During the scenario where you save people from the burning building in Zen, if you fail, you will just face a game over. But the original plan was to have Sabin get trapped in the collapsing building. If the player brought Edgar here, there would have been a heart-wrenching scene of Edgar desperately digging through the rubble to find his brother, to which he would either never find him, 
or find his lifeless, limp body. Figaro no Kekan, Tales from Desert While on the subject of the Figaro brothers, their character designer also created a non-canon doujinshi about the upbringing and family life of the two brothers, and what it was like growing up in royalty and watching their father get poisoned by the Empire. The book's name translates to The Marriage of Figaro, which is a homage to the famous opera of the same name by Wolfgang Mozart. 90s Myths and Rumors There was a plethora of misinformation and myths that ran rampant in the 90s. There was a rumored set of lasers for the airship that would allow you to destroy the Cult of Kefka Tower. There was a myth that said you could buy the Imp, Chocobo, and Miniature Airship at the auction house. There was a myth that you could get the Esper Yura from the well in Thamasa after the events in the floating continent. There was a myth that you could catch the Siegfried Imposter on the Phantom Train and get a relic out of it. There were rumors that you could revive Sid, Elaine, and Owain through various means. And nearly all of the temporary characters were rumored to be unlockable through obscene circumstances. Although we would eventually find that there are methods of glitching these characters into the game, but most people argue that there exist no methods in a legitimate playthrough of the game. Either way, Square paid homage to some of these rumors through the Game Boy Advance version of the game. Secret of Evermore Cameo This other Squaresoft game featured a gladiator scene at a coliseum. When examining closely into the crowd, you can see several FF6 party members, Locke, Mog, Realm, Strago, Terra, and Umaro. FF6 is a play. FF6 was written in a perfect five-act Shakespearean tragedy format, that's why the ending plays in this manner, showing the epilogue of each character in a theatrical manner as well as explaining why there is a curtain and stage in the ending. An interview with the devs in the early 2000s confirms that FF6 was actually all just a play. Permanently Missable Content With just how much was jam-packed into this game, it's no surprise that Final Fantasy VI became notorious for content that could be completely skipped accidentally sometimes permanently losing access to them through the rest of the playthrough. There exist a number of abilities, cutscenes, items, and more that have certain time frames or criteria that must be met in order to access. Some great examples include Mog's Water Rondo Dance that requires you to enter the water terrain in the World of Balance. During these water battles in Lete River and Serpent Treno is the only time you can learn this powerful Mog dance. Gao also has an optional scene where he meets his father. The team help to prepare Gao for his first introduction to him by educating him on some proper English as well as dressing him up in more civilized clothing. There's even a humorous bit of dialogue from Setzer that remarks on the other's poor fashion sense, another jab at Locke. Before Gao can even be introduced to his father, the old man recounts a horrible dream in which he had a demon child, and he purposely abandoned him at the Velt, going on to say that the recurring nightmare child still haunts him to this day. Sabin was horrified by the response from the man, and threatened fisticuffs, but Gao steps in and defends the old man before leaving the house. Despite hearing that he was indeed abandoned as a small child, with a father that doesn't even wish to have him in his life, Gao still was just happy to learn that his father was alive. Other missable content includes rare dialogue from characters like Shadow, who has more dialogue in optional cutscenes than in normal playthrough. It's staggering to think of all of the content that was overflowing from this game, considering the developers took the liberty to create it, knowing full well that it may be skipped entirely by the player, 
in the hope that they may one day enjoy their hard work. Who is Gogo? Most people believe that Gogo is simply a cameo from FF5, where a boss named Famed Mimic Gogo offers a very unique battle in which he mimics your party members. The battle theme is even similar to Mog's theme from FF6. At the end of this, he will banish himself from the battle, presumably transporting himself to the dimension of FF6. Some even believe that he's sent to the same void that another famous recurring character uses, Gilgamesh, which can be learned through side quests in FF8, 9, and 12. But the theories for Gogo's true identity are numerous. Some people believe it's Daryl, Setzer's ex-girlfriend. Others believe that the character is actually the return of Emperor Gestal, who was last seen being thrown off the floating continent by Kefka. This is also supported by the fact that Gestal also wore large robes, possessed an arsenal of magical abilities, and would also have a grudge against Kefka. Another prominent theory for Gogo is that he's actually Shadow's former partner, Baram. Shadow's dream suggests that Baram perished, but since it's never been confirmed, some people connect the dots here. Though each of the temporary characters have at one time or another been suggested to be Gogo in disguise for a variety of reasons. These include General Leo, Biggs, Wedge, or Bannon. These are especially applicable since these characters' fates are never conclusive in the game. Another interesting theory is that Gogo is actually Realm's mother. Perhaps one of the more eccentric theories is that Gogo is an avatar of chaos, similar to Kefka, except Gogo doesn't have the same level of evil as Kefka. This theory goes on to suggest that he was sealed by the goddess statues, but when Kefka destroyed the balance, Gogo's prison was broken, and when the Zone Eater consumed his prison, it forced Gogo to be stuck in the FF6 realm, trapped in limbo, wandering aimlessly. And a fan favorite meme theory is that Gogo is actually an infamous politician named Adlai Stevenson. The supporting evidence for this revolves around several quotes from the politician that align remarkably well with Gogo. Despite being a troll and meme theory, several individuals would dig further into this and debunk the theory. Edgar's Double-Sided Coin Some suggest that Edgar's coin actually serves as a metaphor, with the two-headed sides of the coin representing the nature of the brothers. This can be seen exemplified in the ending scene. Edgar uses the coin as a way to determine the responsibility of the royal kingdom, which neither of them really wanted. But Edgar knowingly took on the responsibility of the kingdom, essentially freeing his brother of the burden. Another scene shows Celeste using the double-sided coin to cheat during the conclusion of the Opera House segment. Setzer even comments on it at one point. If Edgar and Sabin are in the party at this time, Sabin will take notice of Setzer's comment, where he realizes that his brother actually released him of his duty to Figaro after all. FF4 and FF6 Connection Theory Some fans believe that the Americanized numbering of Final Fantasy 4 and 6 as 2 and 3 is more appropriate than people realize. Some evidence suggests that the War of the Magi that happened a thousand years ago in Final Fantasy VI was actually the war that takes place in FF4, a callback that makes VI look like a sequel to IV just a thousand years later. Fans also suggest that the warring triad depicted in the statues of VI was actually the three Lunarians from Final Fantasy IV. It's a lot to unpack, but Astute observers have noticed that there are also similarities in the geography of both of the game's maps. Sonic.exe is FF6 theme remixed. While we know for certain that this media uses the Kefka lap from FF6, some also theorize that the Sonic.exe creepypasta 
is simply the World of Ruin theme remixed. Sabin's True Name The Japanese name for Sabin is MASH, but in Romanji, the system of romanizing and translating Japanese, it appears more as Mashu. And Mash was actually based on the biblical name of Matthew. This has caused people to believe that his true name would have originally been Matthew, or at least a biblical name resembling it. But Ted Woolsey opted for the name Sabin instead, which many people theorize is a result of Matthew being seven characters long, where the character limit for the names was six. But there are people advocating for and against this theory. What are your takes? Mog created the world. This is in reference to the North American promotional materials for their release of Final Fantasy VI, officially known as FF3 in the West. Between this television commercial and the Nintendo Power Magazine ad, we see Mog zapping a number of enemies out of existence or into piles of dust. Most believe that Mog is destroying the monsters, but there are some deeper speculations that have been made. Some believe that he's actually transporting them into the game world, and that he actually plays as the silent narrator, director, creator, or perhaps even the primary character of the game. This is further evidenced by the fact that Mog is heading the Final Fantasy III casting, and while we only see monsters being cast for the game, humanoid characters may also have been cast, and we only see this part of the casting process. And knowing that the game is based on a play, this further leads credence to the notion that Mog may be the director behind it all. And perhaps the icing on the metaphorical cake is the fact that Mog lies front and center on both the front and back of the box art of the North American release. Sid Cannibal Theory we find out in FF6 that Sid is actually the brilliant scientist developer of the Magitech process that extracts magic from espers and infuses into humans or machines, allowing them to harness the magic. Kefka served as his first test subject, who obviously received tremendous power from the infusion, but since the process was imperfect, Kefka's mind was damaged in the process, driving him to madness. Sid would discover how the process was being used in such atrocious manner and was horrified. After Kefka caused the cataclysm, Sid woke up on a solitary island in the middle of the ocean, with several other survivors as well as Celeste. It's said that he cared for the other survivors while Celeste recovered from her comatose state. The story also suggests that the other survivors on the island slowly dwindled in number as they leapt from the northern cliffs in despair. But if you examine the island, there are no bodies or graves anywhere to be seen. Also, we know that when Celeste leapt from the cliff, her body ended up washing ashore later on, but none of the other survivors did. We can also take note that there's barely enough fish to even keep the dying Sid healthy, suggesting that there may not have been enough food to support such a population of survivors. The game suggests that Sid worked himself sick while caring for Celeste for an entire year, but this gruesome theory suggests that Sid actually acquired a rare, incurable, and fatal disorder called Kuru that is contracted when consuming the brains of other people. Is it possible Sid survived on consumption of other island survivors? Kefka's Real Identity Perhaps the only other identity more impactful than that of Gogo is Kefka. There is an ample amount of people that truly believe Kefka is actually Shadow's former partner in crime, Baram. During the flashbacks that show Shadow, known as Clyde then, pairing up with Baram to become the Shadow Bandits, the great train robbers of the century, clearly giving inspiration to Shadow's future moniker. 
On one mission, Brahm suffered an accident and insisted that Clyde leave him behind so as not to get caught. Clyde was hesitant to leave him, but after finally deciding to leave, Baram begged him to finish him off with his knife, so as not to suffer the inhumane acts that he would face if caught. But Clyde simply could not bring himself to do it. While Baram screaming his name, Clyde apologizes but runs away, leaving the other half of the Shadow Bandits to suffer an unimaginable end. The game leads you to believe that Baram perishes after this, but this theory suggests that Baram would be caught and taken as a prisoner, where the Empire would conduct early Magitek testing and experiments on him. So between being left on the brink of death and having conducted inhumane experiments upon, Baram would lose his identity as Baram and forge a new one known as Kefka. Some other correlations include both characters having blonde hair, both characters having at least somewhat similar appearance, and both characters having dialogue that suggests a somewhat uneasiness about the sight of blood. It's also suggested that Kefka sought the power from the Warring Triad as it was his only foreseeable way of attaining the type of ultimate power and control he wishes he had during the time of being abandoned and tortured. He was unable to even take his own life, asking Clyde to do it for him, but he would attain that power and more, leading to the final entry. Kefka won the game. Kefka is one of, if not the only final boss in the series, that literally achieved everything they wanted by the end of the game. He wished to become a god to have ultimate control, and it would be attained. He literally altered the world as he saw fit to the shape of his madness. But after he would attain everything he wanted, nihilism would set in, and his life lost every sense of meaning. Kefka simply had nothing left to attain. All of his wishes were granted. When he finally achieved his goal of ultimate satisfaction through chaos and destruction, he had nothing left to pursue, finding meaninglessness everywhere he looked, and he chose to die at the hands of the player. And that's it for this video. Be sure to comment if I missed anything, and let me know what videos we should cover next. Big shout out and thank you to the channel members, and thank you for watching. Maker out.